Our subject today is the beast kingdom or the reign of the Antichrist. The Bible makes it clear that such a man is coming. In John 5:43, Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. We do not know the name or the title under which this man will be known to the world. He will undoubtedly have a forceful and pleasing personality. He will be a statesman of the highest possible qualifications. He will seemingly be impartial, realistic, and compassionate. He will sponsor a program designed to bring equality to all nations, all classes, and all individuals. He will cut down waste in industry and government, find ways to increase production and efficiency, curb crime, abolish unemployment and poverty, and bring in universal peace among nations. He will introduce a formula for a one-world government that can be set up without sacrificing the sovereignty of the individual nations. At least, this will be his campaign pledges. To a world facing economic disaster and the threat of nuclear annihilation, this man will seem like a dream come true. The labor unions will see him as the champion of the working man's cause. The environmentalists and social reform people will consider him the partner and friend for whom they had previously searched in vain. The universal church of the day will hail him as the direct answer to their prayers. The underprivileged countries will see in him their final hope for survival and advancement. Israel will enter into a seven-year agreement with him and hail him as their long-awaited Messiah. The Bible has many names and titles for this man, for God will not see him as man sees him, but rather he will be abominable in the sight of God. In Daniel, he is referred to as the prince that shall come, a vile person, and the willful king. When eventually he succeeds in getting his image set up in the temple as an object of universal worship, this is called the abomination that maketh desolate, or the abomination of desolation. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, he is called the man of sin, the son of perdition, that wicked one, etc. In 1 John, he is called Antichrist. And in the book of Revelation, he is known as the beast. Some seem to think this crowning book of the Bible is the revelation of the beast, but it is not. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation does not present the beast riding forth to take the world away from God. The earth at that time will already be under satanic influence and to a large extent satanic domination. What the book of Revelation does present is Jesus Christ, the mighty conqueror, riding forth in a final mopping up operation to rid the earth of the last vestige of Satan's influence and misrule. Prior to this time, Christ has already dealt Satan two decisive defeats. Satan's first mortal defeat took place on the cross of Calvary, where he bruised the heels of our lovely Lord by having him nailed to a tree. But where the bleeding Christ bruised Satan's head, according to the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. 
by paying the awful penalty for man's sin and then rising again from the dead, as the Apostle Paul puts it, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Yes, when Christ cried, it is finished, on the cross of Calvary, full redemption was provided and Satan was defeated. Christ triumphed over Satan. Praise God. A second great victory over Satan will take place at the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 we read, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. As multiplied millions of the redeemed are caught up into the earth's atmosphere, they immediately encounter myriads of demon spirits. For Satan is the prince of the powers of the air. Ephesians 2, 2. The result is recorded in Revelation 12, 7 to 12, where we read, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the world, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Revelation 12, 7 through 12. In the 12th and 13th chapters of Revelation, the beast kingdom is introduced and described. The 13th chapter begins with the conjunction and, indicating that the 13th is a continuation of the 12th. After Satan is defeated by Christ at Calvary, and again by Michael at the time of the rapture, he retreats to planet Earth, determined to use what little time he has left in direct opposition and defiance of Almighty God. The highest ambition of Lucifer has ever been to dominate a kingdom. Turn with me to Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. It was the ambition of Lucifer, later known as Satan, to exalt his throne above the stars of God. Satan has always wanted to be important. Five times the pronoun I is used in this passage, 
I will ascend. I will exalt my throne. I will sit upon the mount. I will ascend above the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Listening friend, are you aware of the fact that every time you seek to exalt yourself, you are acting like Satan? Our highest objective as Christians should be to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, not ourselves. When Satan is cast down to the earth, according to Revelation 12:9, his very first move will be to set up an earthly kingdom. Since he belongs to a dimension other than ours and does not have a material body such as ours, the only way he can dominate the earth is by dominating a human being and by persuading that man and at the same time enabling that man to do his exact will. This was illustrated in the life of Judas Iscariot. At the Passover table where he made his final decision to go out and betray our Lord, we are told in John 13:27 that Satan entered into him. And it was after this that he went immediately out to perform his dastardly deed of betraying Christ, even with a kiss. Judas Iscariot and the coming beast emperor are both spoken of in Scripture as the son of perdition. This does not mean that these are one and the same person, nor does it imply that both were predestined to do what each of them will do or have done. Every one of us has been given the power of choice. Because God is perfect in understanding and foreknowledge, he knows in advance what each of us will do. Nevertheless, had these two men chosen to live for God rather than for Satan, they each could have found salvation and heaven like all other sinners. In 2 Peter 3.9 we read, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The coming beast emperor is first mentioned in Revelation 11.7. The context tells of God's two witnesses who will be ministering at that time in the spirit and power of Moses and Elijah. In the name of Jehovah, these two men will stand up to the emperor just as Moses dared to stand before Pharaoh and Elijah before Ahab. God will mightily use these two spirit-filled men during their three and one-half years of public ministry. Then in verse 7 we read, And when they had finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. Isn't it strange that the beast is never mentioned during the first ten chapters of the Revelation? The trumpet judgments end in chapter 11. Could it be that these judgments are all passed before the emperor even arrives on the scene? I am sure you will agree this isn't likely. Even here in Revelation 11, he is merely mentioned without an introduction, except that it is said he is from the bottomless pit. There are three reasons why we believe this man had been around a good while before he finally managed to slay God's servants, the two witnesses. One, he must have been several years rising to power. Secondly, he may have been on the throne for some time before signing the seven-year agreement with Israel. Thirdly, we believe it will be near the end of the seven-year period when the two witnesses are slain and resurrected. If all this be true, the career of the beast is nearing a disgraceful 
end before he is even mentioned in the book of Revelation. This is one more proof that this book is not written one, two, three in chronological order. Now turn with me to the one chapter in the Bible that throws the most light on this sinister individual and the kingdom over which he presides. Revelation 13. We will first consider verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. This is a symbolic description of a kingdom rather than that of its ruler. Notice the similarity here to Revelation 12, 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and I beheld a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. In verse 9, this dragon is identified as that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceiveth the whole world. In Revelation chapter 17, we are told the seven heads represent seven kings of past and future history, and the ten horns refer to ten kings of the future who will reign for a short period with the beast emperor over the beast kingdom. In the final analysis, then, the kingdom we are considering is actually Satan's kingdom, and the man on the throne is Satan's man. Furthermore, the struggle that will so vitally affect the human race during the reign of the beast is actually the stepped-up battle of Lucifer's rebellion against the authority of Almighty God. And Satan is simply using men and women as pawns in his hand. Going on in Revelation 13, verses 2 and 3, we read, And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. To understand these two verses, one must go back to the book of Daniel, in chapters 2 and again in chapter 7. God reveals in symbolic language the four great world powers that would dominate Israel from the time of Daniel until the return of Christ to reign. The Bible calls this period the times of the Gentiles. Jesus said in Luke 21:24, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. At the moment, Israel is back in her homeland enjoying self-rule, yet curtailed in certain respects by pressure from the United Nations and even from the United States, her friend and ally. When she signs the seven-year treaty with the beast emperor, she will unwittingly sign away her independence and again become a vassal state. For this reason, the times of the Gentiles are still not fulfilled. Israel's greatest time of trouble is still future. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. The first Gentile power to conquer and dominate Jerusalem was Babylon, symbolized by the lion king of the forest. The second was Medea Persia, likened to a bear. This was because this kingdom was slow, cumbersome, and yet very powerful. The third kingdom, Greece, under Alexander, was compared to a leopard because of the lightning swiftness of its conquests. The fourth kingdom, Rome, was like a beast 
that was to be so ferocious that it was indescribable. It is this last kingdom that is described here in Revelation 13. It is more terrifying than any nation of history, for it has retained all the bad qualities of all these previous empires. That is why it is compared to a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Continuing on in Revelation 13, we read in verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. The Roman Empire was in power when John, under divine inspiration, wrote the book of Revelation. Later the kingdom was divided into the east and west divisions, just as predicted in the second chapter of Daniel. The West Roman Empire gradually grew weaker and finally collapsed in A.D. 475. The East Roman Empire survived until 1453. Now for over 500 years there has been no Roman Empire as such. But one of these days the deadly wound will be healed and the Roman Empire will be resurrected. This fact is recognized by nearly all prophetic Bible scholars. The restoration of the Roman Empire is not a 20th century dream. In the year A.D. 800, Charlemagne succeeded in uniting Germany, France, Italy, Holland, and Belgium, and was crowned by the Pope of Rome as Emperor Charles Augustus. He was a great leader, but it was not God's time, and his Roman Empire was short-lived. The first Tsar of Russia was Ivan the Terrible in 1547. He chose this title because this is the Russian rendering of Caesar. The last Tsar was Nicholas II, who was overthrown by the communists in 1918. Every one of these Tsars wanted to be another Julius Caesar. Some of us still remember Kaiser Willem of World War I. This emperor of a united Germany chose this title because his dream was to conquer the world. He thought of himself as another Julius Caesar, and Kaiser is the German form of the Latin Caesar, which means emperor. Both Hitler and Mussolini had as their goal the revival of the old Roman Empire, but Hitler's dream of a Third Reich that would uh, last a thousand years fell flat, and the bluffing Mussolini turned out to be a paper tagger. Not one of these attempts was able to produce a Ten Kingdom Federation such as Daniel predicted and the book of Revelation confirms. You see, until God's prophetic clock strikes, any effort to fulfill Bible prophecy will fail. Today, however, a ten-nation federation in Western Europe and bordering on the great Mediterranean Sea is well underway. Jean Monnet, father of the common market, is credited with saying, as long as Europe remains divided, it is no match for the Soviet Union. Europe must unite. Servan Schreiber, author of the American Challenge, has said, a successful response to American technology, organization, and research demands a united European effort. Dr. Walter Halstein, former head of the European Economic Community, has stated bluntly, three phases of the European unification are to be noted. First, first the customs union, second, the economic union, third, the political union. 
What we have created on the way to uniting Europe is a mighty economic political union of which nothing may be sacrificed for any reason. Its value exists not only in what it is, but more in what it promises to become. At about 1980, we may fully expect the great fusion of all economic, military, and political communions together into the United States of Europe should all go according to the most optimistic schedules the common market could someday expand into a ten-nation economic entity whose industrial might would far surpass that of the Soviet Union. End quote. Well, it's now 1982, and there are now ten nations in the European common market. The original time schedule may not be exactly on time, but the eyes of the world are now on the common market nations. We would not go so far as to say that this is the revival of the Roman Empire, but it is certainly an important step in that direction. It is also interesting to note that the common market was born at the Vatican in Rome in 1948. Let us read more about the beast emperor that is to come and eventually preside over the new Roman Empire. In Revelation 13, 4 and 5 we read, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. We do not know how long this man will continue as head of the Roman state. He will be in league with Israel for seven years, so we would assume he will be emperor of Rome for at least ten years. What is undoubtedly inferred here is that he will head some strong international federation for three and one half years. This is partially explained in verse 7 of this 13th chapter. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. This man is often called Antichrist because he is undoubtedly opposed to Christ. Being, no doubt, an apostate Jew, he will not find it inconsistent to honor Jehovah and at the same time blaspheme Jesus Christ. He will also set himself up as a substitute for Christ. In comparing Antichrist with the true Christ, Salem Kerbin has arranged a very thought-provoking table we will not have time in this message to consider the scripture verses that go with each of these statements, but those familiar with the scripture will recall the Bible authority for each of these statements as they are read. As we read, you will note the decided contrast between God's man and Satan's man, Christ and Antichrist. Christ came from above, Antichrist ascends from the pit. Christ came in his Father's name, Antichrist comes in his own name. Christ humbled himself, Antichrist exalts himself. Christ was despised, Antichrist will be admired. Christ came to do his Father's will, Antichrist will do his own will. Christ is now exalted. Antichrist will be cast down to hell. Christ came to save. Antichrist comes to destroy. Christ is the good shepherd. Antichrist is the idle and evil shepherd. 
Christ is the true vine, and a Christ is the vine of the earth. Christ is the truth, and a Christ is the lie. Christ is the Holy One, and a Christ is the lawless one. Christ is the man of sorrows, and a Christ is the man of sin. Christ is the Son of God, and a Christ is the Son of perdition. Christ is the mystery of godliness, and a Christ is the mystery of iniquity. Christ is God, manifest in the flesh. Antichrist is Satan, manifest in the flesh. Unquote. Listening friend, the blood has never lost its power. If you are not saved, come to Christ right now and let him wash your robes and make you white and clean in God's sight through the blood of the Lamb. God bless you.